the past and the, the past group analysis and totalitarianism, the past and the unexpected future. Werner and I had this idea of organizing this panel uh, to bring in some uh, concerns about uh, the current situation that the world is facing, but also have in mind the early days of Fuchs and the way that he had to leave Germany to England to conceive group analysis. So the panel, uh, let's ask Dieter Nitzken or Hopper and Sonny Gaborzoni to raise your hands because you will be on the front page. Go to the, to the reactions where there is raise, Yes, or Dieter, can you raise? No, 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 your hand, but the, the reactions on the, on the, no, say something, Dieter, say something that you will be come to the first page. Okay. Okay. Okay, you are here. So you see my hand, but it's not. Yes, <laughs> and Gabor, where are you? Gabor? Gabor, I seen you. <laughs> oh, yes. Where yes. is Gabor Zoni? Yes, yes. Where is Gabor? Yes. Okay. Yes. Here. Here. So let's introduce our panelists of today. Uh, we will start with Dieter Nitzken. Uh, Gabor Zoni. Hi, Gabor. Dieter Hi. is MA, is group analyst, group tra training analyst, from the group anal training analyst, supervisor, group analyst from Heidelberg, IGA Heidelberg, and the German Society of Group Analysis and Group Psychotherapy, former editor of Group Analysis, our journal, and the International Journal of Group Analytic Psychotherapy. The word is yours. Thank you for this uh, kind invitation, Carla. Um, well, as you, as you already said, I'll, I'll put together some ideas uh, about Fuchs's view of totalitarianism, um, which he, he was a subject he was very interested in. In her book on the origins of totalitarianism, Hannah Arendt, argued that the totalitarian systems of Nazi Germany and Stalinist Russia must be compared not so much to understand one or the other, but to understand our times in ourselves. Although we do not know what for sure whether Fuchs was familiar with her book, it is evident from his writings that he agreed with his view. Looking back on the first half of the 20th century, he wrote in 1950, conditions in which modern man lives force him to cope with mass and group problems to an extent by certain unknown. And he added that the totalitarian states themselves make vast scale experiments in solving these problems. As an early example of such totalitarian experiments and the way they were put into practice, um, which keeps on haunting us, was the collectivization of agriculture in the Ukraine as part of Russia's first five-year plan from 1928 to 1933. Initiated by Stalin and the members of the Politburo, this state-controlled program directed by Lazar Kaganovich caused the killing between three and four million inhabitants of the Soviet Ukraine by starvation. Similarly, Hitler in 1941 also aimed to colonize the fertile territory of the Ukraine in order to transform Germany into a world power. Accordingly, as Timothy Snyder said, mm, um, no other land attracted as much colonial attention within Europe than the Ukraine. At the time Fuchs wrote about the effects of totalitarianism, he emphasized that in order to escape these nightmare conditions, scientific study of the group 
and of developing techniques to deal with it are urgently needed as a counterpart to the mass techniques of the totalitarian states. As we know today, this hope was certainly too optimistic, then and now. However, it would be wrong to consider this aspect as the main element of his contribution to the understanding of totalitarians. There are other and more clinically based considerations which are still relevant today, awaiting further elaboration. One of these is Brooks's often cited comment on the case of the so-called murderous mothers, who said he harbored, who, who said harbored conscious death wishes, murderous impulses towards their children that were neither repressed nor warded off by reaction formation. This syndrome, Fuchs admitted, struck me very much, and I must confess that my thought was that the emergence of such an orientation into open consciousness as an egocentric attitude, so to speak, was, was an expression of the progressive demoralization of the whole of our culture since the advent of Hitler, Stalin, and under the impact of two world wars and the murder of literally millions of innocent people. Fuchs actually complained that such a broader view of the case was not taken into consideration by his colleagues who merely arrived, he felt, at a diagnostic differential classification of these types of mothers, actually young working class women from the UK. As we now know from the historical research, from historical research, Fuchs's view of the case is far from fancy. Keith Lowe, a British historian in his book on the savage continent, Europe in the aftermath of World War II, documented that the corruption of moral standards in all European countries dramatically increased throughout the, the war, even in neutral countries like Sweden and Switzerland. Building on this group analytic, building on this group analytic view, Lowe's study, Lowe's study adds historical substance to the group analytic claim of Fuchs that all psychopathology is essentially comparative. Putting this forward, he succeeded to conceptualize what his sociological friends, Norbert Elias and Franz Borkenau and others, had posited all along, but without being able to theorize in clinical terms, namely in terms of a group analytic theory of sociocultural transmission. Responding to a paper presented by Ivanov, a Russian psychiatrist in the apartment of psychiatry in the, at the Kirov Institute in Medicine in Gor at Gorky, Fuchs summarized the essentials of what he meant by a comparative psychopathology. He wrote in the group, that is an analytic group, which is taken to represent the community. All the values of the culture are under constant scrutiny. Therefore, manifestations, whether normal or abnormal, with their concealed philosophical assumptions are under constant review, including, for instance, semantic analysis as part of the process. This process of re-evaluating and restating sociocultural valuations and norms goes hand in hand with a revision of the image of authority, an authority which Fuchs believed is ultimately located in the community itself as the, in an anonymous collective. In his first book, he noted, what the community supports quite blindly and is instinctively is determined by its life conditions, historical and present, by, it, by its survival value. This, I presume, is the gist of what Fuchs, as a group analyst, had to contribute to the debate on totalitarians. However, <clears throat> in one of his last papers, he refined his earlier view, applying Robert Velder's notion of mass psychosis to the group analytic theory of sociocultural transmission. Fuchs cautioned that we share with our culture, we, wait, we may share with our culture some totally mad assumptions that pass on as normal. 
Due to this, the norm becomes in itself psychotic. However, as in individual psychosis, the ego then takes side of these beliefs and habits. Unfortunately, today we are witnessing, witnessing once more the horror of the unexpected eruption of such a state of mad madness in the middle of Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dieter. It was fantastic uh, putting in perspective what folks had in mind. So following our panel, I will call or Hopper. Just see. Our Hopper is a sociologist, group analyst, and psychoanalyst, honorary member of the Group Analytic Society International, honorary member of the Institute of Group Analysis UK, and the distinguished fellow of the AGPA or however the others wish to be introduced. I, I would uh, add that he is editor of a uh, new international library of group analysis. And he is a long time member of CAS. The word is yours, Earl. Thank you, Carla. Uh, as a uh, editor of NILGA, uh, I'm very pleased to have published and edited your new book on crowds and large groups, which I'm sure we still have to touch on for, here and there for the rest of the, the day. I speak as a kind of bridging person between Dieter and Gabor, coincidentally, uh, today, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. I'm pleased to speak between the two following Dieter and connecting with Gabor. My my talk, which I uh, was thinking uh, about, it goes back to conversations that I actually had with Norbert Elias 60 years ago in Washington, D.C., as it happens, on my way to England and the University of Leicester. And we were at a, an International Sociological Association conference. And we, we were talking uh, about the ways in which uh, the sociological community continued to split Marx, Weber, and Durkheim from one another. And that an issue persisted in really appreciating Durkheim, not just as a sociologist, but as a pre-Freudian social psychologist. Now remember this discussion very, very well. But from my point of view, which is something I continue to think about today and most of my career, is really in terms of the Durkheim problem, what I thought of as the Durkheim problem. Durkheim, as you know, is one of the fathers of sociology and social psychology. And the problem was that whereas the division of labor associated with industrialization was producing untold wealth for limited amount of effort. Nonetheless, as a kind of irony or contradiction, it seemed to create conditions under which uh, what he said from time to time was an abnormal development. And I think he used the word abnormal which was already a kind of psychological term rather than a, psycho, a sociological term, in that alongside the untold, the, un, the release and creation of untold amounts of wealth, two things seem to happen. One is from time to time, people's expectations would completely outstrip their levels of achievement creating intense psychotic anxieties, which went under various names, but certainly sociologists later called feelings of relative deprivation. The issue being that no matter how much you were able to organize the society into enabling people to achieve, they would nonetheless never feel satisfied. 
And from time to time, this dissatisfaction would erupt in various ways. Now, one of the ways in which that would erupt was that society itself and the rules and regulations and patterns of working together would collapse and become very diffuse uh, so that the principles of group and crowd formation would prevail over the development of institutionalized ways of working, regulating feelings, the, uh, carrying out the law and maintaining justice and so on. So that a kind of social regression would occur such that large group formations would overwhelm societal structures. Now, this would go by various names, but on what he was really saying was that there would be mob development, horde development, and above all, masses. The hordes, masses, mobs, or whatever words you want to use, would take over from societal formation. And the second process would be what we could call anomogenic processes. And that was, in a way, the name given to the development of anomy, such that a kind of widespread insatiability for various kinds of goods would prevail, such that no matter what you did in terms of production, you couldn't create widespread satisfaction. Now, there was an implicit acknowledgement, never fully spelled out, that this couldn't be called just something abnormal. It had to be explained. And one of the ways it was explained was in language which I would use today would be in terms of social trauma. So there would be processes of stagflation and various kinds of failures of dependency in the economy and in the new structures of corporate life. So social trauma would in a way give rise to mass formation, and widespread insatiability. One of the things associated with these two processes was the rise of certain kinds of dictatorship or what we would now call narcissistic leadership, for example, and that many of the new kind of psychologists and early psychoanalysts, including Freud himself, began to discuss this process in terms of the psychopathology, not of the situation, but of the leaders who came to prevail in this mass horde uh, or mob formation. So rather than concentrating on the structure of crowds themselves in a sociogenetic sense, the function, the, the activity was directed towards the personalities of the leaders of these formations. And while well, you, you, most of us here know what Freud had, had to say about the leaders of mobs in terms of various kinds of projections and identifications with pieces of the internalized father projected in the group formations. And of course, very important work of Adorno on the authoritarian personality and variations of, that his colleagues contributed to making that a more complex notion. And of course, Arendt and others began to talk about the totalitarian personality. And later, and actually in, in late 60s and 70s, it didn't come to fruition into about 1978 or 80. Kit Boles and others began to talk about the fascist state of mind. So we had two or three pieces of work on character structure, personality, or states of mind of the people who would come to lead these particular formations. But com still comparatively little direct study of the group formations themselves are the creation of processes such that such leaders would come to the fore. But there are exceptions. And in a way, 
Dieter has put his finger on it. Fuchs actually was one of the first and almost the only person in our field, broadly defined, who said we need to focus on the very nature of totalitarian structures and processes themselves. Now, Fuchs often used the word group when he really meant society and society or institution when he really meant group. We have to remember that English was not exactly his first language, and he overused the word group to refer to many kinds of social formations. But his early work, even if it was only an essay or two, was stressing, let's study the nature, the social nature of totalitarian formations. Now, actually, uh, in, De Mare had more to say than Fuchs himself, or at least if not to say it, he was certainly far more interested in group analysis as therapy, by which he meant we needed to find ways of providing therapy for society itself. And that is actually connected with his developing work on, on large groups. But Bian and Turke were also absolutely driven by the same concerns is to find out about the nature of totalitarian movements. However, as early, well, as Kleinian analysts, they emphasized envy and the death instinct as part of the innate quality of human beings. This was rather different from the Fuchsian and de Marais focus on Socio social dynamics themselves and the nature of trauma. This is such an important development in the history of our discipline. Now, as a former sociologist who was then becoming a group analyst and psychoanalyst, I personally was obsessed in my professional life with trying to integrate these two approaches because I thought Beyond's work on basic assumptions was brilliant, but I couldn't accept the primacy of the death instinct and envy as the driving force which prevented him from conceptualizing more than the, the three basic assumptions that we're all familiar with. However, if you bought into the Fuchsian and de Marais project, also emphasizing a kind of existentialist and sociological perspective, you would say trauma is at the heart of the human condition, trauma and helplessness and failed dependency, not envy and the death instinct. And it was that turn, that twist even, that allowed me to conceptualize incohesion, aggregation, massification as a fourth basic assumption based on the fear of annihilation following trauma. Now, I would just want to develop that just for a moment, because as my thinking has continued about this, I think it's important to say we all use the word massification processes. We think that we understand what we mean by it. I barely do, but certainly it has to do with homogenization, boundary violations, and pathological merger, and, and so on. And similarity to the point of identification at all costs. But really the twin pillars of massification processes are fundamentalism and scapegoating and absolutely go together. You could even describe totalitarianism in public and private life in terms of dictatorship as a process which makes scapegoating a continuing activity because you have to marginalize and peripheralize any individuality that stands up against the group. And fundamentalism, which is a completely a continuing shift towards making certain belief systems, values, and activities sacred. Now, it seems to me that scapegoating and fundamentalism as the twin pillars of massification, following failed dependency and so on, can exist in all social systems, and indeed does exist in all social systems. Societies, the context in which we usually talk about totalitarianism, but also in our organizations and in our institutions. 
not just in terms of the foundation matrix, but in terms of the dynamic matrices of our organizations. Now, I am in my spare time, uh, I've worked as an organizational consultant, including in organizations in our field for several decades. And in fact, I still do. And I frequently come across intolerance as a function of fundamentalism and scapegoating associated with massification, very close to home. I saw it recently in the last few years, for example, at the Tavistock Clinic. Well, I saw it at the Institute of Psychoanalysis where there was a kind of Kleinian ascendancy in which other forms of psychoanalysis were constantly treated with a degree of contempt and dilution. Marginalization occurred to analysts who didn't buy into those prevailing assumptions. I've seen it more recently at the Tavistock Clinic, for example, in the, in the way in which gender identity disorders were treated, in which anyone in the entire organization and in the community who objected to the young age at which puberty blockers and other hormone uh, injections and various kinds of interventions, anybody who objected to this or raised questions about it, were treated it with a kind of canceling culture at the constant marginalization that anybody that was occurred for and towards anyone who raised questions about the wokeness, some conscious, some unconscious, that underpinned this particular approach. Nobody could speak out against it. We'll come back to that in a moment. I've seen it in the American Group Psychotherapy Association fairly recently, in which people who asked questions about the dilution of the clinical project were again kind of scapegoated and assumed to be prejudiced and racially prejudiced uh, and, and so on, such that the dialogue could not continue. And I've seen it very close to home in the Group Analytics Society and the Institute of Group Analysis, in which, to my chagrin, really, the social unconscious as a concept and theory have been fetishized and ritualized and concretized in such a way that discussion about the social demography of individuals has become a substitute for working in unconscious depth, so that if you know somebody has, for example, a working class background or is a member of a particular ethnic group, people make all sorts of assumptions about that person's character and treat them as though they have made a sophisticated understanding of the personality in depth on the basis of certain aspects of social identity which may not even be a matter of social identity as much as social demography. And I've seen situations recently in my professional communities where this couldn't be discussed, challenged, or thought about openly for fear of being assumed to be prejudiced yourself. And be very specific about it. I think it's very important that as group analysts, we continue to commit to the clinical project as our Portuguese colleagues do, for example, with whom I feel very identified in which they have not felt the need to reject the personal and interpersonal matrix, but assume that as persons working in the personal matrix also opens us up to the dynamic matrix and the foundation matrix. Now, to conclude, if I work in terms of the personal matrix, interpersonal matrix, which I do in my clinical work, I would also say that creativity, innovation may also rely and stem from and trace it, it, the crucible 
of individuality and creativeness and capacity to be a whistleblower also has to be explored in terms of in the, the personality and the social background, which is two sides of the same coin of individual people. Creativity, innovation, and the capacity to be a whistleblower can't simply be traced to the dynamic matrix and the foundation matrix. That's why I so much appreciate the role of outsiders and the marginal people in our field. And if we cease to make space for marginal people and outsiders and deviants, we are lost to totalitarian influences. Because in fields like ours, where there is always going to be a high ratio of assumptions to propositions that can be tested, there is a deep natural tendency to scapegoat and marginalize such people. And yet there are precious resources for keeping our profession alive and well. Stop that. Okay. Thank you all for your presentation. Thank you very much. So now our last presenter of the day, um, invited by our colleague, Werner, but uh, is Gabor Zorni, MD, psychiatrist, psychotherapist, sociologist, training group analyst from GA Budapest, training psychoanalyst, Hungarian society, board member, consultant of the European Psychoanalytic Institute, previous member of IPA ING in the 90s board member of IAGP, board member of CAS, by the time treasurer, past editor in chief of Psychotherapia Hungarian language. Please, Eva, the word is yours. Thank you. I uh, give a small title, Expected the Unexpected. Do we learn from the past? I grew up and spent over 40 years, more than the first half of my life, under a type of the Soviet regime, called in a perverted way, socialism, means taking care for the well-being of the people. In the last 25 years, I have been involved in supporting the development of psychoanalytic organizations in countries which belonged to the Soviet empire, named until now Eastern Europe politically. Uh, politically. In my input, I am going to focus on two topics. A, some special characteristics of group being among totalitarian circumstances experiences and observations during Soviet times, that's the past in Hungary, B, the present of the future, observations on and experiences of the Psychoanalytic Institute for Eastern Europe about the formation of new analytic organizations, study groups, in the countries coming out from or still again inside suppressing states, and how war breaks apart the local and international containing capacity of those organizations. In fact, the expression totalitarianism brings a variety of political systems under one umbrella. I propose to take the quantitative dimension, which may turn into qualitative differences, into consideration. It helps if we try to distinguish between what is supported, what is tolerated, and what is forbidden persecuted in the functioning of the state system. The quantitative differences in the ratio between those leads to qualitatively different political systems regarding suppression versus freedom and consequently the divergent place 
psychotherapy, group therapy in general, and group analysis in that countries. The simplest way to differentiate can be done along the leading slogan of those in power. You place the actual political practice between two following ends. One, who is not with us is against us and will be handled as such, or who is not against us is with us and will be handled as such. In Hungary, as late consequence of the revolution in 1956, we moved from the first strong totalitarian to the second, called the funniest barrack of the Soviet camp, from around the middle of the 60s. Not surprisingly, from that time, we have the first group analytic training groups and did the first vacillating steps to re-establish the Hungarian Psychoanalytical Society, first founded in 1913, and rejoining to the International Psychoanalytical Association. I give you, I give you. To function analytically, psychotherapeutically, why you belong to the domain not tolerated means being in the underground that does not allow acceptable functioning. Hardly any real therapeutic group work can be done then. Regarding the nature of group or individual analytic work based on the freedom to look at and question everything. You cannot belong among the supported ones either. If you believe you are there, then you are pseudo supportive or a pseudo analyst, or we are no more in the totalitarian regime. So, we must explore how to exist in the domain tolerated, how to survive and cope with it, by practicing analytic group therapy. Michael Shebeck formulated the interiorized totalitarian object, simplified the everyday experiences which get internalized and transmitted through generations. That means we must take into consideration the further quantitative aspect. How long people live under totalitarian circumstances. For instance, the Soviet regime persisted in the satellite states over 40 years, in Russia over 70 years. That makes two to three generations. More than enough time to familiarize with, to interiorize and to take, even if hated, as the natural, normal part of culture or the way of being. In the large society, small groups might have genus phase. They are the public space where the individuals are equal, are contained, and can express themselves free. The space against secret wrongdoing. But the small group can also be the place to wipe out individuality, to enforce uniformity, and to execute different degrees of totalitarian control especially during the hard dictatorship, prescribed small group gatherings were part of daily life in Hungary. For instance, on the workplaces, before starting daily work, the people had to hold so-called party journal half hours. Already at schools, all children had to apply for pioneer membership with regular meetings. Everyone had to join the trade union with similar team meetings where people used to be openly evaluated on their socialistic moral. Those groups had double level. On the surface, they represented equality to speak, to manifest yourself. On the secret level, reports were written about everyone and you did not know who wrote them and what was in the report about you. A setting in which it is abnormal not to be paranoid. In the Communistic Party, trust reporting about fellow members and comrades was present 
from the lowest to the highest level, you could have power, but were never in security. This skill of solidarity. People develop typical strategies, coping mechanisms to live and to survive under stronger or weaker totalitarian circumstances, just to name some. Double speech, one for home and another for external use. Socialistic connections to find individual persons in power and getting something just for yourself. Avoid standing old, stay gray and average. Had always two irons in the fire. Do critical type of work under the umbrella of a hiring communist who was allowed to follow his personal little hobby, which was your work. Therapy groups represent a public setting. They are witnesses in contrast to individual therapy with its secrecy and intimacy. From the totalitarian point, individual therapy is dangerous. Group therapy can be survived. However, people getting together from fear, free will for their own sake are threatened for the system. Also, group therapy can be used and misused by the political regime. We can follow this in the development of group analysis in Hungary. In the late 50s, the type of analytic group work started from the professional encouragement of Michael Ballin from London at, then, at the time, who made us acquainted with the work of Bion and Fuchs. Running therapy groups in inpatient psychiatric wards in the countryside was seen as brave initiative. The first self-experiential groups organized for professional clinicians was looked at with suspicion and reservation, fear that it gets infectious. In the 70s, after 20 years break, psychology, psychotherapy, and sociology got into the domain tolerated. This led to a rapid blossoming. On basis of pre-war psychotherapeutic organizations, a dozen of methods appeared, also non-governmental organizations could not be found. Group analytic and psychodrama groups played a special role. So-called psychotherapy weekends were organized where interested colleagues got no different methods in small groups. Also, large groups belonged to the program attended by 100 to 250 professionals. The following shows the perverted character of the time. The party, there was only one party, so it was always called the party, uh, initiated an investigation against the psychotherapy weekend because those looked to be too psychoanalytic. By many training analysts of the even restarted psychoanalytic study group forbade to the candidates to participate at the weekends, stating that it destroys the analytic process. Nevertheless, the project was defended by leading psychiatrists hiring also in the communist. Becoming a psychoanalyst gave the personal flavor to be oppositional without being in the opposition. And the analytic group made a gentleman's agreement with IPA, the international. Uh, it became a so-called, and it stated in the ROSTA, unofficial study group, which was not included into the ROSTA, there was a uh, secret. And the Hungary it existed autonomously, but only as a subsection of the psychotherapy section of the government of Hungarian Psychiatric Association. The non-conscious culture, transgenerational, automatic com coping mechanism infiltrated into group work. The survey on the topics of place in psychodrama groups proved this, similarly so in analytic groups as well. It's all done by Clara Aikai, participants brought up easily intimate sexual disturbances, relations to money, etc., but never spoke about their political or religious involvement. The general public kept distance from group therapy, 
which also indicates how deep mistrust toward the other and the fear to share any private survive, embedded into the social unconscious. In the first one, two decades after the social political changes in 1989-90, patients looked exclusively for individual psychotherapies. Nowadays, therapy groups are highly requested and popular because a new generation grew up in between. In the last 25 years, I was involved in fostering the training of analysts in the former Soviet Empire countries and in helping to set up local autonomous analytic groups societies. The experiences in the European Psychoanalytic Institute taught us early that it is not enough to train individuals. The more difficult task is the transformation into independence with democratic functioning. We face that they suffer from lower professional self-respect, also regarding their own professional group. One of the causes is that the deeply interiorized coping mechanisms to live in and with totalitarianism and subordination survive in us for generations even after the political social circumstances have changed. Paolo Fonda, the first director of EPI, speaks about progenitor syndrome, and it is a complicated matter to cure it. We had to face and must face, amplified by the current war against Ukraine and the easy appearance of totalitarian type trends in many countries over the world, that the totalitarianism virus is ubiquitous at all levels, in the family, the teaching and working organizations, nations, or empires. Just closing, during the preparation to this panel, a memory obtruded in my mind, which I forgot for long. In the second half of the 90s or beginning of the 2000s, we had a so-called school for Eastern Europe candidates in St. Petersburg. We stayed at a huge hotel, about 120 participants, and a teacher's staff of 25 persons. We wanted to have a teacher's meeting, but the hotel did not offer any meeting room. On the ground floor, there was a kind of coffee bar and no guests. There were comfortable couch stack seats, ordered in an S way. Automatically, we arranged the furniture in a circle and placed ourselves. The service lady at the bar left the place. Two minutes later, she came back, accompanied by two police-like persons who carried Kalashnikovs holding at us. They ordered us to immediately rearrange the furniture into the original format. If you have ever seen a bunch of distinctive analysts, including myself, to turn totally white pair, that was it. However, we short, uh, very shortly, I got relaxed by thinking, welcome at home, just follow the order, do not add your rationalities, remain in the background, and it will be over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gabo. It was a really pleasure to, to have the three of you speaking about an important topic. And also, uh, sometimes we are not aware that we also have the privilege of being together and from uh, uh, getting together people from different countries and the possibility of speaking. So therefore, I'm very glad that we have uh, colleagues as well from uh, from Russia and Ukraine among us. So uh, the word is with you. Please, if somebody wants to, to make a question, you can raise your hands, but also Earl, Gabor, and, and Dieter. Uh, Dieter, where are you? Come back to the, you are not on my screen. You can start a debate among yourselves, if you would wish, 
or ask questions. Mm -hmm.